This podcast is for the introduction to The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. I'm going to read the first six or seven pages to you, and also I will be referring to pages six and seven of The Great Gatsby Packet, especially regarding some of the discussion questions that are there. But first, turn to the second piece of paper in the book, in the copy of the book that you have. It's the title page. And here we see F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby. And then there's a quote. And this quote is actually from a character in This Side of Paradise, F. Scott Fitzgerald's first novel. And you see it says, Then wear the gold hat, if that will move her. If you can bounce high, bounce for her too. Till she cry... Lover, gold-hatted, high-bouncing lover, I must have you. If you were here for the day that I went over F. Scott Fitzgerald's life, this kind of repeats the story of him and Zelda. And if you turn to the next page, you see once again to Zelda that he noticed in his life, especially once he was at Princeton, that money uh, seemed to be what would attract a lot of the women there. And so in the quote, it's saying that if the gold hat moves her, if that convinces her, if that is what she loves, then figure out a way to wear the gold hat to become rich so that she says, I must have you. Definitely relates to the novel as well. So the objectives here for chapter one is that we're able to define a participant observer and a reliable narrator and to be able to relate both to the novel. We also should be able to identify East Egg and West Egg, the fictitious peninsulas in the Long Island Sound, and be able to understand who lives where. So please turn to page one, chapter one. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, Just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you've had. He didn't say any more, but we've always been unusually communicative in a reserved way, and I understood that he meant a great deal more than that. In consequence, I'm inclined to reserve all judgments, a habit that has opened up many curious natures to me and also made me the victim of not a few veteran bores. The abnormal mind is quick to detect and attach itself to this quality when it appears in a normal person. And so it came about that in college, I was unjustly accused of being a politician because I was privy to the secret griefs of wild, unknown men. Most of the confidences were unsought. Frequently I have feigned sleep, preoccupation, or a hostile levity when I realized by some unmistakable sign that an intimate revelation was quivering on the horizon. For the intimate revelations of young men, or at least the terms in which they express them, are usually plagiaristic and marred by obvious suppressions. Reserving judgments is a matter of infinite hope. I am still a little afraid of missing something if I forget that, as my father snobbishly suggested, and I snobbishly repeat, a sense of the fundamental decencies is parceled out unequally at birth. This is going to come full circle by the end of the novel. We'll revisit it then. But essentially, early on here, Nick, Nick Carraway, who is the narrator of the novel, who is not the main character of the novel, of course Gatsby is, but in many ways his psychology and what's going on in his head is a major character. And so he describes how those with abnormal minds often reacted to his tendency to reserve judgment. He said that because of his father's advice, he doesn't judge people. And so there were a lot of secrets of wild, unknown men that he became privy to. These people opened up to him because they saw somebody, a normal person, as he put it there, who wasn't going to judge them. So they opened up to them, and they told him all of their revelations and he calls them plagiaristic and marred by obvious suppressions but nonetheless they open up to him and he says it's because he doesn't judge this is what makes him 
a reliable narrator in his mind. He's saying that he's a reliable narrator, that he basically isn't going to judge. He tells things as they are. At the same time, what's interesting is that here he is judging these other people, calling them abnormal minds, and we see that he was actually unjustly accused in college of being a politician, which doesn't mean that he was running for office or whatever, but that he was basically trying to please everybody and act nice to ev- nicely to everybody uh, for his own benefit, which is what a politician does, of course. And he says that he never sought these out. He pretended that he was sleeping. He pretended that he was preoccupied uh, or that he was uninterested. And people just gush to him. They tell everything to him. That basically answers numbers one and two. Page two, number three in the questions, though, asks, why would these qualities be useful for a first-person narrator? Now, you think about it. This book is written in first person, so there's no omniscience. We can't get into other characters' heads. We can't see all and know all as a third-person omniscient narrator would be able to do. However, because people open up to Nick, they tell him everything, we basically get a form of omniscience in that. They're going to tell him secrets that they are uncomfortable telling other people. Uh, This is going to come from numerous characters in the book. So it is advantageous uh, for a first-person narrator to have this quality. Plus, if he's right and he's relatively reliable as a narrator, we're getting the real story. We're getting an accurate depiction of events uh, without bias. That will be up to you by the end of the book to decide, is he biased or not? I'll continue on. And after boasting this way of my tolerance, I come to the admission that it has a limit. Conduct may be founded on the hard rock or the wet marshes, but after a certain point, I don't care what it's founded on. When I came back from the east last autumn, I felt that I wanted the world to be in uniform and at a sort of moral attention forever. I wanted no more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gatsby. The man who gives his name to this book was exempt from my reaction. Gatsby, who represented everything for which I have an unaffected scorn. If personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, then there was something gorgeous about him, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, as if he were related to one of those intricate machines that register earthquakes 10,000 miles away. This responsiveness had nothing to do with that flabby impressionability which is dignified under the name of the creative temperament. It was an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person and which it is not likely I shall ever find again. No, Gatsby turned out all right at the end. It is what preyed on Gatsby, what foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams that temporarily closed out my interest in the abortive sorrows and long-winded elations of men. So, back to the questions. How did Nick feel after returning from the East the autumn before? It said that he wanted the whole world to be at a sort of moral attention, that despite the fact that he said that he doesn't judge people, that conduct has a limit. He doesn't care what it's founded on. The hard rock, probably meaning religion, or the wet marshes, meaning philosophy. But he doesn't care what it's founded on, but there has to be a limit. And when he came back to the east, from the east, excuse me, to the Midwest, where he is telling the story, he is disgusted by the behavior that he saw in the east, in New York. Something that happened there disgusted him to the point, perhaps that it even made him leave. And then he says that only Gatsby is exempt from this reaction, which is really interesting. It's paradoxical, really, because he says that Gatsby represents everything that he hated. To quote him, he says, everything for which I have an unaffected scorn. So here, Gatsby is everything that he despised, yet Gatsby was exempt from his disgust. So we'll find out what that means in the story. He then describes his personality as an unbroken series of successful gestures. So there's something about him that was heightened to the sensitivity of all the promises in life, that there was this hope about him. We'll find out about that too. 
as part of the question in number five, it says, what does our minor participant observer say about him? A minor participant observer is somebody who is not really the main driver of the action in the story. So in Huckleberry Finn, Huck Finn's the main character. Okay? In Catcher in the Rye, Holden Caulfield, the first-person narrator, is the main character in the story. Here, Nick really isn't. It's about Gatsby. Uh, and many other characters as well, you could argue, drive the action a lot more than Nick does. He just observes. And because of some of the qualities we've already mentioned, uh, he's able to pull in a lot of information and describe things as such. Number six, that's the personality, is an unbroken series of successful gestures. It's just something smooth about him, uh, some way that he made you feel comfortable, and it was his extraordinary gift for hope that he loved about him. And then it said that something preyed on Gatsby. This is a really interesting line, third to last line in that section. What foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams. So you know, wake of something, first of all, it could be a pun because a wake uh, is a funeral service, essentially, is a, a viewing. Uh, but the wake of his dreams is, you think about the wake of a boat uh, that's going along the water, it's like the waves that are pushed out a result, as a result of it, too. And so it's like this leftover. It's like what happens when his dreams were destroyed. It was a foul dust that preyed upon him and that made him really cynical. It made Nick very cynical and disillusioned as a result. So then there are these three stars at the bottom of the page. Anytime you see that in the book, and I identify it with all capital letters like I do in the questions there, it means that you're hitting a flashback, you're hitting a, a shift in point of view on some level and also a flashback to a different time. And so you really have to be aware of those because they don't say flashback. It doesn't say several years earlier or something like that. And now Nick's just going to tell about his family. And also we're going to enter the frame, the actual story. What we've seen so far is the frame itself around the story. But in a frame story, you have the frame, which is kind of like if you think of a movie like Forrest Gump, where he is telling the story from the future about the past. That's the frame. And now we're going to get into the actual story itself, which is inside of the frame. It's a story within a story. My family have been prominent, well-to-do people in this Middle Western city for three generations. The Caraways are something of a clan, and we have a tradition that we're descended from the Dukes of Buclic, but the actual founder of my line was my father's brother, who came here in 51, sent a substitute to the Civil War, and started the wholesale hardware business that my father carries on today. I never saw this great uncle, but I'm supposed to look like him, with special reference to the rather hard-boiled painting that hangs in father's office. I graduated from New Haven in 1915, just a quarter of a century after my father, and a little later, I participated in that delayed Teutonic migration known as the Great War. I enjoyed the counter raid so thoroughly that I came back restless. Instead of being the warm center of the world, the Middle West now seemed like the ragged edge of the universe. So I decided to go east and learn the bond business. Everybody I knew was in the bond business, so I suppose it could support one more single man. All my aunts and uncles talked it over as if they were choosing a prep school for me and finally said, why, yes, with very grave, hesitant faces. Father agreed to finance me for a year, and after various delays, I came east, permanently, I thought, in the spring of 22. The practical thing was to find rooms in the city, but it was a warm season, and I had just left a country of wide lawns and friendly trees, so when a young man at the office suggested that we take a house together in a commuting town, it sounded like a great idea. He found the house a weather-beaten cardboard bungalow at 80 a month, but at the last minute the firm ordered him to Washington and I went out to the country alone. I had a dog, at least I had him for a few days until he ran away, and an old Dodge and a Finnish woman who made my bed and cooked breakfast and muttered Finnish wisdom to herself over the electric stove. It was lonely for a day or so until one morning some man more recently arrived than I stopped me on the road. How do you get to West Egg Village? He asked helplessly. I told him, and as I walked on, I was lonely no longer. I was a guide, a pathfinder, an original settler. He had casually conferred on me the freedom of the neighborhood. And so, with the sunshine and the great bursts of leaves growing on the trees, 
just as things grow in fast movies, I had that familiar conviction that life was beginning over again with the summer. Stop there again, answer a couple of questions. How does Nick describe his family? In what ways are they part of the American dream? Obviously, he said that they were from a well-to-do family in the Midwest, and his father is able to finance him to go to the East to give his try at the American dream on his own. Uh, this kind of overlaps with number nine. After he came back from the Great War, World War I, that because he'd enjoyed the counter raid so much, uh, enjoyed probably the sense of purpose, probably the action, probably the camaraderie, and perhaps being in charge of others, uh, that when he came back to the Midwest, it seemed like, as he put it, the ragged ed edge of the universe. And so, as we talked about in the class, the 1920s, the bull market, everybody who's in the bond business figured, why not go and try to make it on his own? And so he moved to New York to try for the American dream. But we can't stress enough that, I mean, his family gave him money to go do it. He was educated at New Haven, okay, New Haven, Connecticut. That's Yale. So certainly he is somebody who's pretty privileged. But at the same time, uh, we have to respect him for making an effort of achieving the dream on his, on his own. Number 10. We're about to hit on page four. I'll continue. There was so much to read, for one thing, and so much fine health to be pulled down out of the young, breath-giving air. I bought a dozen volumes on banking and credit and investment securities, and they stood on my shelf in red and gold like new money from the mint, promising to unfold the shining secrets that only Midas and Morgan and Mycenaeus knew. And I had the high intention of reading many other books besides. I was rather literary in college. One year I wrote a series of very solemn and obvious editorials for the Yale News. And now I was going to bring back all such things into my life and become again that most limited of all specialists, the well-rounded man. This isn't just an epigram. Life is much more successfully looked at from a single window after all. It was a matter of chance that I should have rented a house in one of the strangest communities in North America. It was on that slender, riotous island which extends itself due east of New York and where there are, among other natural curiosities, two unusual formations of land. Twenty miles from the city, a pair of enormous eggs, identical in contour and separated only by a courtesy bay, jut out into the most domesticated body of salt water in the Western Hemisphere the great wet barnyard of Long Island Sound. They are not perfect ovals like the egg in the Columbus story. They are both crushed flat at the contact end, but their physical resemblance must be a source of perpetual confusion to the gulls that fly overhead. To the wingless, a more arresting phenomenon is their dissimilarity in every particular except shape and size. I lived at West Egg, the, well, the less fashionable of the two, though this is a most superficial tag to express the bizarre and not a little sinister contrast between them. My house was at the very tip of the egg, only 50 yards from the sound, and squeezed between two huge places that rented for 12 or 15,000 a season. The one on my right was a colossal affair by any standard. It was a factual imitation of some hotel de ville in Normandy with a tower on one side, spanking new under a thin beard of raw ivy and a marble swimming pool and more than 40 acres of lawn and garden. It was Gatsby's mansion, or rather, as I didn't know Mr. Gatsby, it was a mansion inhabited by a gentleman of that name. My own house was an eyesore, but it was a small eyesore, and it had been overlooked, so I had a view of the water, a partial view of my neighbor's lawn, and the consoling proximity of millionaires, all for $80 a month. Across the courtesy bay, the white palaces of fashionable East Egg glittered along the water, and the history of the summer really begins on the evening I drove over there to have dinner with the Tom Buchanans. Daisy was my second cousin once removed, and I'd known Tom in college. And just after the war, I spent two days with them in Chicago. Stop there. What illusions does Fitzgerald employ to describe the knowledge needed for Nick's new job? And why does he use these illusions? These are on page four. 
alliteration here, Midas and Morgan and Mycenus. Midas, the Midas touch, everything you touch turned to gold. Morgan, J.P. Morgan, actually pretty much the founder of U.S. Steel. And Mycenus, who was the patron um, of uh, Virgil and other poets and artists in ancient Rome, who was rich. And so the three of them, obviously very wealthy, and that's what he's going for. You know, a quintessential element of the American dream is you know, wealth, money, the um, acquisition of wealth and material things. And so he lines up these books with all of these secrets in them, and he hopes to make money in the bond business. What adjective, number 11, is used to first describe the island? Slender, riotous island. Really interesting way to put it, riotous. We'll find out more about that later. He lived in West Egg, which, by the way, these don't really exist. Uh, there are different communities that have similar uh, attributes in the area there, but the idea of the two shapes don't really exist. Is that's fictitious. But he lived in West Egg, and that is the less fashionable of the two. This is a source of constant confusion, not only to the gulls overhead, but also to students who think, well, Gatsby lives there. Gatsby lives in West Egg. That must be the richer of the areas because of this incredible house that he has that imitates a hotel in Normandy in terms of its scope and size. But one thing we have to understand is that West Egg is less fashionable because it is basically filled with people with new money. Now, this is of confusion as well because you would say, well, wait a minute. I would expect that people who made their own money in the United States would earn more respect than those who inherited it. This isn't England. This isn't a country where uh, one's family and one's past dictates who he or she is. Well, in more ways than you think, that is the case. Uh, apparently, in those com really wealthy communities, people with old money that is handed down to them, they look down on people with new money. Uh, some reasons for that are family history, tradition, but it's beyond that. It's the way they speak. Uh, the skills that they have in terms of what kinds of sports they play, whether it be polo um, or golf and, and things that get handed down from generation to generation, that the new money people uh, just wouldn't have the sophistication uh, that the old money people have. Uh, so we have to understand that Nick and Gatsby are in West Egg, but he describes East Egg as being the more fashionable of the two. And he says that they live in these white palaces, okay? Interesting word choice that we would usually uh, associate uh, with a monarchy, with a, a feudalist system, uh, as opposed to the American system. And so West Egg, less fashionable. Gatsby's Mansion, this is number 13, an imitation of a hotel in Normandy, colossal by any affair, a marble swimming pool. East Egg, more fashionable. The houses are described as palaces. That's number 14. So it's important that we understand that contrast, and we're going to watch throughout the book how Fitzgerald is explaining that separation, that dichotomy between old money and new money. Page 6. He's talking about Daisy, his second cousin once removed, her husband, Tom, Tom Buchanan, is who he's describing here. And we will describe him on the character chart, which is on page four of the packet. Her husband, among various physical accomplishments, had been one of the most powerful ends that ever played football at New Haven. A national figure in a way. One of those men who reached such an acute limited excellence at 21 that everything afterwards savors of anticlimax. His family were enormously wealthy. Even in college, his freedom with money was a matter for reproach. But now he left Chicago and come east in a fashion that rather took your breath away. For instance, he brought down a string of polo ponies from Lake Forest. It was hard to realize that a man in my own generation was wealthy enough to do that. Why they came east, I don't know. They had spent a year in France for no particular reason, and then drifted here and there unrestfully wherever people played polo and were rich together. This was a permanent move, said Daisy over the telephone, but I didn't believe it. I had no sight into Daisy's heart, but I felt that Tom would drift on forever, seeking, a little wistfully, for the dramatic turbulence of some 
irrevocable football game. And so it happened that on a warm, windy evening, I drove over to East A to see two old friends whom I scarcely knew at all. Their house was even more elaborate than I expected, a cheerful red and white Georgian colonial mansion overlooking the bay. The lawn started at the beach and ran toward the front door for a quarter of a mile, jumping over sundials and brick walks and burning gardens. Finally, when it reached the house, drifting up the side in bright vines as though from the momentum of its run. The front was broken by a line of French windows, glowing now with reflected gold and wide open to the warm, windy afternoon, and Tom Buchanan, in riding clothes, was standing with his legs apart on the front porch. He had changed since his New Haven years. Now he was a sturdy, straw-haired man of thirty, with a rather hard mouth and a supercilious manner. Two shining, arrogant eyes had established dominance over his face and gave him the appearance of always leaning aggressively forward. Not even the effeminate swank of his riding clothes could hide the enormous power of that body. He seemed to fill those glistening boots until he strained the top lacing. And you could see a great pack of muscles shifting when his shoulder moved under his thin coat. It was a body capable of enormous leverage, a cruel body. His speaking voice a gruff, husky tenor, added to the impression of fractiousness he conveyed. There was a touch of paternal contempt in it, even toward people he liked, and there were men at New Haven who had hated his guts. Now, don't just don't think my opinion on these matters is final, he seemed to say, just because I'm stronger and more of a man than you are. We were in the same senior society, and while we were never intimate, I had always... I always had the impression that he approved of me and wanted me to like him, with some harsh, defiant wistfulness of his own. We talked for a few minutes on the sunny porch. And we'll stop there, right before the beginning of the actual dialogue, the first dialogue in the book, and go to the questions. Describing Tom on the character sheet, there's plenty that I mentioned there that you'd be able to put on there uh, in regards to his physical prowess, uh, his past and his athletics, and his attitude. We definitely want to get the word supercilious on there. That's in the third line on page seven. That's one of the vocabulary words, but it means just really arrogant. Uh, it talks down to people, and uh, even to people that he likes. Uh, there's a, an element of paternal contempt, contempt like a father, uh, talking down to everybody. And uh, we can include some other things like the, the cruel body that... Nick mentions. Top of seven, how did Tom get his money? He had inherited it. And we've been talking a little bit in class about uh, shortcuts to the American dream or like different paths to the American dream. And so can you say that somebody who inherited all that money and was that wealthy in college and now at 30 has the ability to purchase a whole string of polo ponies to bring to his home um, th that sounds immaculate? Can you call that somebody who's achieved the American dream? Is it different? The Buchanan's house, we would include the yard that goes for a quarter of a mile from the beach to their house. It's a white Georgian colonial mansion and more extravagant, more opulent than Nick had even expected. Number 18, I already mentioned, a cruel body. All right, continue from there. Uh, remember that we want to read chapters one and two. And to continue answering the questions in the packet, that I'll check those. And hopefully they got you off to a good start. The rest of it after this, there's a lot more dialogue. There's action. But really pay attention to how uncomfortable they are at this luncheon because of the phone ringing and what you must infer as a result. Also, Daisy's reaction to them mentioning one of Nick's neighbors. You know, all the things there that should imply something to the reader, just pay close attention to that. Uh, but it moves a lot faster from here on out. Thank you for listening.